What is it that makes a great fight scene great? What separates the contenders from the also-rans? We're gonna pick through the best fights in anime, scrape by scrape and blow by blow to find out. I'm Jeff Thu, and this is Animelee. And this Animelee will once again be a bit different, as you may have surmised from the title and thumbnail. Avatar The Last Airbender's fights, while very good, tend to be on the short and sweet side, so instead of analyzing one in exhausting depth like I usually do, I've decided to make a list of my favorite fights in the series, ranked very roughly by quality of choreography, animation, and writing, and give them a shorter analytical overview. Also, if I'm being perfectly honest, these videos are kind of a copyright nightmare, and I'm hoping a change of format that lets me use shorter clips might help alleviate that. There are a lot of incredible fights in Avatar, and I tried to hit a wide variety here, so I'm sure I'll miss at least some of your favorites. I mean, I sort of cheated with one of the entries to squeeze an extra one in here, and I still couldn't fit all the fights I wanted to talk about. If you're not 100% satisfied with my top 10, please respond with your own list in the comments below. With that said, it's about time we get into the action, but first, a quick word from our sponsor. Coverage of tonight's fights is brought to you by Honkai Impact. You've likely heard of this game's little sister, Genshin Impact, but before MiHoYo wowed the world by packing a free 40-hour-plus sandbox RPG onto mobile phones, they were doing similarly impressive work freeing that most anime of game genres, the Spectacle Fighter, from its home console constraints. Honkai Impact lets you take the air-juggling, dodge-countering, three-digit combo-racking fun of games like Bayonetta with you wherever you go. With responsive controls, stunning anime-style visuals, and jaw-dropping set pieces. On top of its well-tuned, tightly animated character-swapping combat system, Honkai features deep character customization, an involved story full of crazy cutscenes, and a wide variety of minigames. Not to mention more gorgeous sci-fi waifus than you can shake a stick at. One of those waifus, Rosalia, just got a stunning new neon-tinged outfit with her fervent tempo delta augment that comes with some equally styling neon-tinged attacks. Those, along with her impressive evasive capabilities, fuel her two energy gauges, which, when full, allow her to unleash a powerful ultimate attack, Fervent Mode, that heats up the battlefield and amps up the power of her sister, Lilia's counterattacks. You can learn more about that new hero while you work to earn her, along with the gorgeous new fantasy-inspired Dream Seeker skin for Sele and other rewards like crystals and Honkai shards by playing the retro RPG in inspired Honkai Quest event. That event's only running till November 19th, though, so click the link in the doobly-doo to download the game and try its frenetic, fast-paced combat for yourself today. Now for the combat you're actually here for. If you've seen other anime lays, then you'll know I've got a strong preference for battles with high personal stakes driven by ideological conflict. But that's not all there is to a good fight, and the first good fight on this list features neither. It's just really, really cool, and full of explosions. Combustion Man, or Sparky Sparky Boom Man, if you're cultured, is probably the least interesting of Avatar's recurring villains. His motivation for pursuing the gang is purely mercenary, literally, and he doesn't have much in the way of backstory or, uh, personality. Thus, it's hard to make fights with him feel personal. But they don't really need to. He's a threatening prop, a B-plot generator that exists solely to inject some action into otherwise low-key episodes driven by other, better characters. And as a living action figure, he is very good at filling that role, which makes him a very memorable character despite his total lack of memorable characteristics. He puts a big, explosive punctuation mark on Zuko's awkward efforts to redeem himself to Team Avatar, on Katara's last big argument with Toph, and in his first appearance, on the Fire Nation tween's soul-searching trip to Ember Island. That first attack leaves a hell of a first impression, too. They only had a few minutes for action in that episode, and they really made him count. Striking from the shadows in the dead of night, Sparky Sparky Boom Man manages to beat back all three of the world-class benders on Team Avatar from half a mile away away without breaking a sweat or giving an inch. Were it not for his heavy boots and the timely warning of Toph's super senses, they would have been 
been dead before they even knew what hit him. With no way to fight back, Aang's basically forced to buy time for his team to beat a hasty retreat on Appa. The silent assassin chases him into a canyon full of stone pillars and immediately shows, rather than tells him, that he can run, but he can't hide. Aang takes the lesson to heart and launches a surprise attack at his next opportunity before he's cornered. But it's really hard to ambush a guy who can blow up stuff with his mind, actually, and only Aang's airbending reflexes, combined with his earthbending training to push through rather than avoid obstacles, save him from the counterattack. Having learned again, his next sneak attack is even sneakier. Utilizing neutral Jing, he waits inside a wall for a chance to attack, and mixes Toph's stone armor technique with the man's own sparky sparky boom to propel himself up to Appa who he might not have reached at all without his glider. And uh, that's it, back to the teenage angst. This is one of the shortest fights in the series by far, but that allows it to be tense, tightly choreographed, and impressively animated from beginning to end. Every shot, every move matters. One misstep and Aang would have died. This sets the new villain up as a serious threat in a matter of seconds. And while the way they at last defeat him is a bit anticlimactic, especially compared to the less G-rated way Korra handled a similar threat, the strength of his introduction cannot be denied. Next up is another short fight that's mostly here by virtue of the rule of cool, though it does have way more of an impact on the show's plot and more significance to the characters involved, those being Zuko in a tea room brawl against Jet. Jet kinda sucks, and it sucks that Jet sucks because his fighting gimmick is awesome. If he didn't drag down most of the episodes he's in by existing, he probably would have made this list more than once. But his tenuous friendship turned angry obsession with Zuko disguised as Lee is the most compelling his character gets. He and his friends are making an earnest attempt to get away from their own self-destructive hatred of the Fire Nation, but Jet just can't do that knowing there are firebenders hiding out in the same city he's run away to. Jet's inability to let that go will ultimately be the ambiguous death of him, but in this episode it just makes him a great foil for Zuko, who, having suffered the consequences of his own obsession on his arduous journey through the Earth Kingdom, is now making a more sincere and successful effort to start fresh. He's determined not to repeat his mistakes from Zuko alone in this fight, and ultimately manages to keep the flames of his rage in check, thanks in part to his own growth and in part to his uncle's encouragement. Iroh also tries to help defuse the situation with some gaslight bending. Please, son, you're confused. You don't know what you're doing. But that's less effective. Character development's all well and good, but the real reason this fight's on the list is its choreography and animation, which are just amazing. Swords aren't the most kid-friendly weapon in the world, so Avatar doesn't get to play around with them too often, but when it does, it's almost always a good time. And I don't think there's any better potential weapon matchup in the show than a duel between the dual sword style of the Blue Spirit and the Head Freedom Fighter's twin hook blades. Both fighters are are exemplary swordsmen, treating their blades as extensions of themselves and using their surroundings creatively. There are a lot of cool things Jet can do with his swords, and he does most of them here, grabbing Zuko's swords and yanking them around, swinging off of stuff with them, and even linking them together to extend his range. That last trick ends up costing both of them a blade, reducing their defensive capabilities and leading to quite a few hair-splitting or uh, mouth grass thing splitting near misses while they're fighting one-handed. Things end before the cuts can get too close thanks to the timely appearance of the Dai Li, who deflect Jet's sword with their rock gloves before using them to cuff him and cart him off to Lake Laogai. And not only does this incident set up the episode of the same name, it's also the first time that we get to see the Dai Li's unique bending weapons in action. And in the very next scene of the episode's A-plot, we see them use those same gloves to covertly yank Team Avatar out of the bear's birthday banquet before they can cause too much trouble. That 
is some seriously efficient action writing, and it helped to elevate this to ninth place. In eighth place, we've got another great villain introduction, this time a three-for-one deal. Insatiably ambitious, sociopathic Azula is probably the most interesting of Avatar's recurring antagonists, with Tai Lee taking third behind Zuko, and May, uh, somewhere below Sparky Sparky Boom Man, I guess. Two out of three ain't bad, though, and their first fight with Team Avatar is an absolute banger. So is the episode in which it happens. Return to Omashu does a stellar job of helping to set the tone for the show's somewhat darker second season, with the occupying Fire Nation army casting a smoky shadow over a city that played host to one of the first season's goofiest adventures. With the Mad King Boomy imprisoned and the Earthbender resistance dwindling in strength and morale, things are looking grim even before Azula shows up. The actual fight centers around a hostage negotiation, with Team Avatar trying to trade Boomy for a baby they kidnapped. Accidentally. It's a long, funny story how that happened, but they are still totally the good guys here. Trust me. And since that baby is May's little brother, and Tai Lee is being, uh, coerced into helping, we know up front that the two are more in this fight for personal reasons than blind devotion to their nation or even to Azula, which will become important in like a season and a half. For the time being, though, they're Azula's cool lackeys with unique fighting skills, and after Aang reveals himself and the princess splits off to stop him from rescuing Boomy, they get to show those skills off. May puts pressure on Sokka and Katara from the front with her seemingly infinite arsenal of hidden blades, while Tai Lee sneaks off under the scaffolding to cut off their escape route with her martial arts skills. With her waterbending whip, Katara is just barely able to open a window for Sokka to run for Appa, which pays off big time when he returns to save her right after Tai Lee showed off her chi blocking abilities. This is an effective way of introducing these new enemies and the unique threats they pose, but of course the main event here is the fight between the Fire Princess and the Avatar, which takes the form of a breakneck chase down Omashu's unique slide-based transport network, Azula riding a stone cart while Aang rides on Boomy. And having already established how these slides work last season, as well as set up Azula's ruthless nature and firebending chops with her attempt to trap Zuko a few episodes back, the show is free to simply let loose and have some high-octane fun with it. Azula doesn't hesitate to chase Aang down the slide, immediately calculating a route that'll help her catch up, and wastes no time putting pressure on him with her extra-hot firebending once she does. She's undaunted by the high speeds and brushes off Aang's counterattacks like so much hot air, forcing him to paddle for his life away from her. She can also match the airbender pound for pound with her agility, easily dodging the debris he tries to use to deter her by ducking into her cart. Even when Aang catches air trying to land on Appa and falls onto a completely different track, she's able to rapidly transfer over and stay hot on his heels. It's only with a precisely timed block from the master earthbender Boomy, our first proper demonstration of neutral Jing, that they're finally able to force her to break off her pursuit. This is a great, intense chase scene that showcases quick-witted strategy on the part of everyone involved, establishes Team Azula as a credible threat, and even lays the groundwork for themes that will drive Aang's earthbending training and character development throughout the rest of the season. It's not the best fight with Azula, not by a long shot, but it's definitely one of the most fun. A lot of the fun in Avatar comes from seeing the interplay of elements as different styles of bending clash. But some of the best fights in the series are duels between benders of the same element. In these battles, strategy and skill are paramount, since the same environmental factors give both fighters an equal advantage. This dynamic is what makes Agni Kai's so exciting, and you know we're going to be getting to at least one of those soon enough. But in seventh place, I'd like to talk about a battle of wills between two master waterbenders from the Southern Tribe, Katara and Hama, the Puppet Master. In sort of, but also not at all the same way that Iroh improved his firebending by studying other elements, Hama's style of waterbending has clearly been shaped by her lifetime trapped in the Fire Nation. It's quite resourceful how she draws bending material out of everything around her, even thin air, 
something benders surrounded by ocean and swamp never have to think about, but the way she bends is also wildly destructive. Where the swamp benders leave the vines that they manipulate mostly intact, Hama kills every tree she drains in violent fashion, and the circle of devastation that she leaves on the lily field looks a lot like a scorch mark. That said, these are still valuable skills for Katara to learn that will help her immensely throughout the rest of Book 3, just as valuable as anything Hama could tell her about her southern heritage. Wow. Uh, yeah, there's definitely gotta be a better phrase I could have used to describe that thing, but considering that Hama's thing is physically enslaving and imprisoning people for being the wrong ethnicity, I guess it still fits. Her signature skill, bloodbending, is all about power and domination, erasing the agency of her enemies. And Katara has the good sense to not be about that at all. It's a little less sensible, as Hama points out, to be so quick to reject her teachings and rebuke her horrific attacks on the nearby village. That is what turns their training session into a fight, and being able to bloodbend gives Hama a huge advantage. But Katara's a powerful bender in her own right, gaining the same strength from the full moon Hama does, and we already know from her training under Paku that she is a very quick study. So the Wicked Witch is only able to toy with her for a few moments before she figures out how to take control of her blood back. And as soon as she rises up, the fight pops off. There's something especially satisfying about the back and forth flow of a waterbending duel, each combatant taking the other's attacks and turning them back around with greater force, though even when Hama puts her full force into a direct attack, Katara's bending is strong enough to deflect it entirely. The tables turn when Aang and Sokka show up, and not the way they usually do, since they end up providing Hama with bloodbending fodder. Outmatched in resources and outflanked, Katara is pushed back on the defensive, which she does handle skillfully, using the same circuitous bending motions to guide her friends safely around her and ultimately immobilize them. However, when Hama stops attacking her and throws Aang at Sokka's sword instead, Katara has no choice but to fight bloodbending with bloodbending. So while Hama is arrested, she kind of wins this fight, or at least gets her way. Katara is a bloodbender now, and out of anger, she will eventually use that power to fight the Fire Nation, just like Hama wanted her to. It's a dark, ambiguous, psychologically scary conclusion to the fight, perfect for the spooky Halloween vibe the episode has going on. And while this fight has interesting strategy, great animation, and strong personal stakes, it's that horror atmosphere that really sets it apart and elevates it onto this list. Now, as soon as I said I liked sword fights, I'm sure some of you guessed that this next entry would be somewhere on the list. Sokka's master marks a real turning point for Mr. Meat and Sarcasm, and while he gets plenty of moments to shine before and after, it is, in my opinion, his strongest solo fight and also the best non-bending battle in the series overall. There's also some very interesting White Lotus world building buried in the episode subtext, like the fact that Lee, the Fire Nation name that Pianda suggests for Sokka, is the same pseudonym that Iroh picked for Zuko, implying that it's part of the Order's undercover training. But we're here to talk about the violence, so I'll save that for another video. Because this fight comes right at the tail end of a training arc, it's able to build on and demonstrate all of the principles of great sword fighting that Master Piandao spends the rest of the episode drilling into Sokka's head. And while the show could maybe be a bit less obvious about the fact that it's doing that, Good use of terrain, fighting from the high ground. And also the fact that Piandao's only pretending to be mad about Sokka lying in order to make his final exam more dramatic, it still makes for a really fun, tactically complex fight. We've spent the whole episode exploring these castle grounds, and now we get to see them put to creative and exciting use. From Sokka's fancy footwork crossing the bridge, to his desperate scramble up the stairs, to the tricky run through the bamboo thicket, classic martial arts movie stuff, this fight moves rapidly across varied terrain, giving both combatants plenty of opportunities to show off both their sword and improv skills. Not to mention, it affords the South Korean animators plenty of opportunities to show off their own imagination and skills. Sokka manages to surprise Piandao several times by thinking laterally about his environment 
environment and weapon, and using everything at hand to gain the upper hand. Over the course of the fight, you get a sense of exactly what the old master meant when he said that Sokka did things wrong in a very special way. But of course, being an old master, Pian Dao is wise to this sort of trickery, and his experience allows him to turn the tables easily every time. This gives the fight a really satisfying push-pull rhythm that, coupled with the unusually lethal arsenal at play, makes it feel tense and perilous despite the relatively low stakes. Pian Dao's not trying to kill Sokka, but he's not pulling his punches either. He really pushes the young swordsman to and past his limits, and only relents when the true extent of those limits has been made apparent. Sokka will put the skills he learns here to very good use in the future, but speaking of push and pull, there's an earlier fight I want to highlight before we get to that. Avatar's action is arguably at its most exciting when the whole ensemble gets involved, and it's almost inarguably at its most technically impressive in big battles featuring an array of skilled combatants fighting on different fronts. Book 1's finale, The Siege of the North, is the series' first chance to really flex that particular strength, and after a whole season of build-up, it doesn't disappoint. While the fight's technically a two-parter, most of the first episode is spent setting the stage for the onslaught of action that ensues in the second. Aang gets embroiled in a fun skirmish on the decks of the Fire Navy fleet, but even after taking out a few of their ships with some creative reapplication of their siege weapons, he barely makes a dent in their forces. Which is kinda the point, he can't do this alone. So he goes to the Northern Tribe's secret oasis to consult with the spirits, setting up Zhao's vile transgression in the next episode, and when Zuko comes to kidnap him, also the minor conflict that will keep his friends too busy to stop that. Katara puts the skills she learned from Paku to good use protecting Aang, and proves that, under the right conditions, she's become more than a match for Zuko. But she lets her guard down a little too early after taking him out, and once he has the power of the sun on his side, he's able to knock her out with a surprise attack, and whisk Aang off into the Arctic wilderness where they can both wait for Sokka and Katara to rescue them because he's kind of a dumbass and rushed in with no plan. In the next episode, while Aang wanders the spirit world, we finally get to see both Fire Nation invasion tactics and the Water Tribe's defenses in action. And it's really damn cool. The Fire Navy's pretty scary with its big steampunk tanks and monster rhinos, and while the Water Tribe mounts an admirable defense with their city's pipes, the invaders' siege weapons quickly demolish that infrastructure. The tides do turn when the moon comes out and the waterbending warriors are able to use the ice and snow of the city's foundations to beat back the assault. Paku looks especially cool here. But then, right when Aang gets back from the spirit world and the gang rescues him, Zhao manages to capture the moon spirit, disarming the city's defenses. And that's still not enough for him. Despite everyone telling him it'll be a really, really bad idea, because you don't mess with spirits, he wants to be Zhao, the Moon Slayer, and he plunges the whole world into darkness out of sheer arrogant idiocy. Immediately, Iroh moves to make him regret it, and when he runs away, Zuko's there to keep up the assault. The choreography in both fights is tight and dramatic, and the flashes of fire against the dull gray backdrop of the moonless world striking. This episode features some of the best use of color in the entire series. That really comes to the fore when Aang fuses with the enraged ocean spirit, turning the world a brilliant blue and unleashing some kaiju-tier tsunami hell on the invading army that almost certainly results in some off-screen violations of his personal pacifistic principles. But, like, who really cares when it looks this awesome, right? Once the moon is done making out with Sokka and ascends to the sky, the color returns to the world, and the ocean spirit leaves Aang on the city wall to go finish off the invasion's leader in a much less pacifistic fashion, finally breaking the siege. One thing this fight does really well is establish personal stakes for everyone involved. For Sokka and Katara, the siege offers a chance of retribution against the very force that devastated their home, and a chance to step up and protect what they care about. For Aang, it's an opportunity to make amends for his absence during the Airbender genocide, and step up to his role as the Avatar, really protecting balance for the first time in his life. The Northern Tribe is, of course, protecting their homes, while Yue gets to step up and satisfy her sense of duty to the tribe and to the world. 
Zuko and Zhao, meanwhile, are each motivated by their pride and a personal drive for glory. Thanks to Aang's choice not to let him freeze to death, Zuko has the opportunity to see what that might cost him, and ultimately puts his pride and his pursuit of the Avatar aside to avoid that fate. Zhao's arrogance won't let him do the same, though, and that ultimately both sows and seals his fate. It's a great fight, but there is room for improvement. For all these moving narrative pieces, there are only really a few active named players in the battle, and their actions don't really intersect with each other much. The team behind Avatar would get better at big battles with practice, and that really paid off on the day of Black Sun, which is my fourth place pick. There are a full 20 episodes of build-up to Book 3's big mid-season climax, and by bringing in old allies and enemies from throughout the previous two seasons, it feels like a culmination of even more than that. On top of the Southern Water Tribe fleet and some stragglers from the Earth Nation army, the Swamp Benders, Haru and his father, a reformed hippo and the boulder, and Pipsqueak and the Duke all add their unique combat talents to the invasion force, while the Mechanist and his son are there to outfit Aang specifically and the rest of the army in general with some fancy new equipment. It's their invention, the submarine, for which the Mechanist is way too generous in crediting Sokka, that allows the fleet to sneak under under the Fire Nation's metal-as-fuck defensive perimeter and reach the beachhead. And it's their bending propelled ice torpedoes, which are just such a cool concept, that allow them to break through the final blockade, too. But once they make land, everyone gets to play a part in the battle, and it is glorious. Toph and the Earth Rumble Boys launch boulders at the Fire Army's ballista towers, while the Earth Nation's segmented caterpillar tanks take on their emplacements and mobile weaponry in awesome fashion, crawling up and crushing them like bugs. Bringing up the rear, the Swamp Benders use truckloads of water to blow away even more tanks as they try to flank, and a seaweed variant of Hughes' Swamp Monster is able to do even more damage to their back line. The Water Tribe warriors look especially cool, fighting hand-to-hand -hand with the Fire Nation infantry and stealing their mounts out from under them, and Sokka, Katara, and Hakoda get to look even cooler when they ride the rare armored Appa up to single-handedly take out the harbor's defensive battlements. Working together, the siblings are even able to surpass their father in combat effectiveness, but that's no comfort to them when he stumbles out of a battlement badly injured, forcing Sokka to lead the final charge up to the capital. Which goes well, too well, considering that there are still 10 episodes left in this season. Because of this two-parter's placement and the fact that Azula's already wise to the plan, you spend this whole fight waiting for the other shoe to drop, which makes the battle feel way more tense and unpredictable than the Siege of the North. And then, right at the end of the first part, Aang realizes the capital is empty. The royals have gone into hiding to wait out the eclipse. Thankfully, Toph can still see with her feet, and with little time to spare, Team Avatar locates and, after an exciting run through a magma cave, infiltrates the Fire Lord's secret bunker. Meanwhile, Zuko, having finally found the resolve to reject his nation's warmongering, goes to confront his father. Though beyond throwing a bit of lightning around to demonstrate that Zuko's taken his uncle's lessons to heart, they don't have much of a fight. With the eclipse under way and the fire army therefore out of the picture, the focus of the battle shifts to a smaller scale skirmish in the bunker between Team Avatar and Azula, who wants to delay their attack on her father. Also, she brought along the Dai Li. Despite the restricted scale, this leg of the fight is even cooler than the preceding battle, especially in its animation. The Dai Li's bending style is just plain badass, even if the magic rock ninjas aren't much of a match for the Avatar and the greatest earthbender in the world. The real star of the show is Azula, though, who is somehow even scarier without her bending. Like, she doesn't attack, but her martial arts and acrobatic abilities make her untouchable on the defensive, even against the supernatural agility of an airbender. After Toph uses metal bending to take out the Dai Li, they are able to corner her, and Sokka has a clear enough head to realize that she's just toying with them. But Azula clouds his head by taunting him with Suki. 
Unfortunately for them, Nickelodeon put some pretty hard limits on what he could do with that sword, and without its pointy, persuasive power, there's little anyone can do to stop Azula from clamming up, running out the clock on the Eclipse, and ultimately forcing the kids to retreat on Appa, while the adults in the invasion force are rounded up by the resurgent firebenders. It's one of the bleakest moments in the series, but with Iroh and Zuko on the run, not all hope is lost. This fight's a real nail-biter from start to finish, with a lot of inventive and impressively animated set pieces, and some really strong character moments. But I do think that Azula's badass non-bending performance kinda steals the show. It's probably the single most impressive demonstration of her natural fighting genius in the series. Except, of course, for that one time she fought literally all of the main characters at once by herself. I mean, yeah, the gang was sleep deprived and Zuko was distracted by all his angst, but she still held her own against all of them simultaneously. And before that, she was straight up winning a two on one against a pretty good firebender and the goddamn Avatar. But maybe I should back it up a bit. There's a lot going on in this episode, character wise. The gang is struggling to adjust to the new dynamic of their now four person group, and with Azula chasing them, keeping them from sleeping, that tension is brought to a head, pushing pushing the strong-headed Toph to leave them. Meanwhile, Zuko's wrestling with his identity, sure that he doesn't want Azula to capture the Avatar, but unsure about basically everything else. He needs his uncle's guidance now more than ever, but isn't yet willing to accept it, so Iroh's stuck tracking him through the wilderness and can only offer his sage advice to Toph, who is helped by it. All of these storylines converge in a crumbling ghost town out in the desert where Aang leads Azula to buy his friends time to escape. The ensuing fight is a bonding moment for Team Avatar, a turning point for both Zuko and Toph, and a cathartic, very long-awaited team-up for us as an audience. But mostly, the showdown is a showcase of Azula's unassailable firebending badassery. It starts with a Mexican bend-off between Azula, Aang, and Zuzu. <laughs> Zuzu? And while the latter two don't fight as a team, making the martial arts mix-up rather chaotic and the layouts and choreography all the more complex and impressive, they do both recognize Azula as the bigger threat and focus most of their attention on her. But she is not daunted one bit by the odds against her. Neither of them is able to break away from her and escape the fight or get the upper hand, no matter what Looney Tune-ass tricks they pull on her. Not only is her fighting sense far more finely tuned than Zuko's, her destructive capabilities far surpass his as well, and she uses her intimidating firepower to control and cut off Aang's escape routes and ultimately back him into a corner. His evasive airbending tactics clearly aren't going to cut it this season. To best Azula on his own, he'll need to take Toph's teachings about facing threats head on to heart. Luckily, he doesn't have to do it on his own right now. Katara and Sokka arrive in the nick of time to pull her off him, and while she is still able to handily fend off all three of their attacks and force them in front of her, even Azula starts to struggle a bit when Toph arrives on their heels to flank her. Her escape is then completely cut off by Iroh unleashing his most devastating attack, and finding herself cornered, Azula swiftly surrenders. But it's a ruse, you see, on account of how she's a lying monster. When Iroh is distracted by the discovery that his new friend happens to be buddies with the Avatar, she takes a cheap and potentially fatal shot at him, and when the others fire off their reprisal, she uses all that energy to fuel an explosion, covering her escape and bringing her fight against the five bending masters, plus Sokka, to a draw, leaving the whole dang town in flames for good measure. By this fight's end, we know three things for sure. Firstly, that Toph is a valuable addition to Team Avatar and needs them as much as they need her. Secondly, that Zuko won't be leaving his uncle again anytime soon and has some serious thinking to do about the mistakes that got him hurt, though he's not yet ready to befriend his old enemies. And thirdly, most importantly, that Azula is not to be trifled with, if her last few fights hadn't made that clear enough for you already. By the end of the book, Aang will at least be able to hold his own against her, but it'll take more than that to actually take her down. 
Next to last on the list, but certainly not least, we have that one thing that I mentioned earlier where I, I cheated for one of these. The series finale, Sozin's Comet, features four fights running simultaneously. Suki, Toph, and Sokka fight to take down the Fire Nation's fleet of blimps, Iroh and his Pai Show Club fight to take back Ba Sing Se, Zuko duels Azula with Katara as a second in the Fire Nation capital, and, of course, Aang, fighting for the first time as a fully realized avatar. Avatar finally has his big showdown with Ozai, the Phoenix King, running on pure comet energy. Two big battles, two life or death duels, all playing out in parallel. And I've chosen to combine them all into one slot for a few reasons. Firstly, they're all so good that if I didn't, they'd fill like half this list. Secondly, they're easily the most talked about fights in the show, and I'd rather not retread too much well-worn ground with this video. And thirdly, uh, Sparky Sparky Boom Man just doesn't get enough love, alright? This war on four fronts marks the culmination of the arcs of almost every character involved. I mean, obviously, it is the series finale. Toph's unbeatable metal-bending prowess and Sokka's tactical acumen are put to the ultimate test as they single-handedly, with some mostly off-screen help from Suki, take down the entire powered-up firebending fleet and stop their Scorched Earth strategy before it can begin. The Old Men of the White Lotus do their part in protecting the world for the next generation, while Iroh finally gets to bring peace and liberation to the land where his son died all those years ago, making amends for his many crimes. Fire Lord Azula's the only character who isn't at her best in this moment. She's spent her life ruling by and being ruled by fear, and her inability to trust has cost her every friend and servant she had, leaving her utterly alone. Zuko, meanwhile, has opened up and made a friend of someone who once hated his whole nation, his family, and him specifically a whole lot, and they now stand together against the mad despot. And Zuko feels like he doesn't even need Katara or any of his friends to fight alongside him because he's stronger just knowing he has their support, while his sister is much weaker without Mei or Tai Lee. I mean mentally, of course. Physically, her firebending is the most deadly and devastating it's ever been in this fight. But so is Zuko's, especially after his training with the dragons. Fueled by Sozin's comet, the heat of their Agni Kai spills out in great towering plumes over the whole of the capital they're fighting to claim. The effects animation in this duel, and in every other scene of this finale, is captivating in its terrible beauty. Though with most of the damage being done by big bursts of energy, it does kind of take on a bit more of the character of a big, bombastic DBZ fight than the technically intricate, intimate, close combat that defines the rest of Avatar. Which is exactly the kind of over-the-top stylistic indulgence that you want to see in a series finale. And it's especially satisfying to see in Aang's duel with Ozai, where we bear witness to the overwhelming might of a true firebending master at the height of his power, and the fully stocked elemental arsenal of a fully realized avatar. Which gets even crazier when Ozai accidentally opens Aang's seventh chakra back up with a high-impact back massage, allowing him to tap into the cosmic energy of the universe once again and reach the Avatar state. From tearing apart Ozai's fire jets with air-bent tornadoes to bearing down on him with fire blasts of his own, everything Aang does after getting his glow on and wrapping himself in a ball of swirling elements is just jaw-dropping to behold. This whole finale is a Sakuga smorgasbord, but they know we've been waiting 60 episodes to see this specifically, and they pull out all the stops for it, especially what would have been the devastating multi-elemental final blow, if Aang hadn't chosen a more pacifistic path. The funny thing is, if he had been willing to kill Ozai, he likely wouldn't have needed the Avatar State buff to beat him, and thus wouldn't have gotten it back. He had a clean shot at killing the bastard with his own lightning, but his unbendable spirit wouldn't let him take the shot. And that same spirit is what allows him to overcome Ozai's ambition and energy bend his power away. 
Which is ultimately what this whole fight is really about. The difference between using physical power to bend the world to your will by force and using your own willpower to do what others think is impossible and shape your own destiny and the world around you with it. What Ozai thinks of as Aang's weakness is really a kind of strength that he could never hope to overcome. That emotional and thematic payoff is what I believe makes this fight feel satisfying, despite the borderline deus ex machina moments that arguably undermine its tactical aspects. The big Agni Kai's a bit stronger on that front. The somber, silent dance of flames that comprises the first part's climax is as brilliant in choreography as it is beautiful in animation, with Zuko using techniques based on all four schools of bending to best his sister, and the strategic choices Azula, Zuko, and Katara make are just as deeply tied to their conflict as characters as those made by Aang and Ozai. Azula sees friendship and trust as a weakness, and aims to exploit that weakness when she aims her lightning at Katara. That does take Zuko out of the picture, but seeing her friend in trouble motivates the compassionate waterbender to fight harder than she ever has before. This is the most impressive display of waterbending power maybe in the whole show, and in underestimating her peasant opponent when she goes in for the kill, Azula allows her own arrogance to be her undoing. Strong as she was, she just couldn't beat two people fighting for friendship. First rule of anime, Fight Club. There's more to unpack about these fights and the four-part finale that contains them, but I'd probably need to double the length of this list to cover them all, so you'll have to wait for the third part of the big book-by-book -book Avatar review that I've just promised to make to hear the rest of it. For now, it suffices to say that Sozin's Comet is one of the greatest climaxes in television history, period. It satisfies on every level, viscerally and emotionally, but even four fights combined can't quite survive surpass the sheer excellence of our first place finisher. Before we get to that though, I'd like to quickly run through some honorable mentions. The fight on the gondola during the Boiling Rock breakout and the battle on the drill in the drill are both amazing, but I didn't want this list to be oops all Azula. On the subject of jailbreaks, the Blue Spirit's first appearance and team up with Aang rocks. On the subject of rocks, I really like the Dai Li, and Jet was like the only thing that kept the battle under Lake Laogai down. And on the subject of men who've wronged Katara, her battle battle with Paku is super good and fun, I just happen to like the fight with Hama a little more. The biggest omission on this list is definitely Crossroads of Destiny, the season 2 finale, which is objectively fantastic, it's packed with great character development, it's the darkest point in the story, the arena they fight in is dope as hell, and it's maybe Iroh's coolest moment before the finale, which is saying a lot. But to borrow a phrase from Nakey Jakey, for some reason the action just doesn't fill my brain with goblin goo the way these other fights do, so it didn't quite make the cut. Okay, actually that's the second biggest omission. The biggest is definitely the samurai duel between Appa and Momo, which gives me almost all the brain goo, but also gives me very little to analyze. But now, it's at last time to reveal the fight that gets my brain the gooeyest, which also happens to be the best fight in the series in terms of writing, animation, and choreography. I know that's a bold claim, especially when I'm lumping together all of the fights in Sozin's Comet, that series finale brings the Sakuga, and the emotional catharsis, and a lot of other things. It's amazing, but as showcases of the majesty of magic martial arts go, it can't quite beat the one, the only, Earth Rumble 6! Not to mention the secret After Hours Underground rematch that follows it. Uh, mainly that, actually. When we first meet them, all three of the kids who form Team Avatar have a lot to learn before they're ready to save anyone. Like, they gotta level up a bit before they're even ready to fight Zuko, and he's barely competent. Toph, in contrast, is that character who joins your party after you've already cleared like five dungeons and still has 20 levels on your strongest dude. When we meet her, she is the greatest earthbender, Master Yu, a guy who knows a thing or two about the subject, has 
ever seen, and her character arc is seeing enough of the outside world to realize that, in fact, she is and always was the greatest earthbender on the planet, and maybe also in history. There is only one way to introduce a character like that. You need to make them look awesome. And Toph's introductory episode, The Blind Bandit, delivers on that front and then some. The whole thing is written like a pro wrestling storyline, which is perfect because Toph is the kind of kid who thinks pro wrestling is real, and also she's the best at it. And just like in pro wrestling, the fighting inevitably spills out of the ring and into the rest of the episode. Every dialogue scene in The Blind Bandit is at least 20% more violent than normal. Katara, of all people, finds out where Earth Rumble is in the first place by beating up two dorks in a back alley, and Toph actively attacks Aang both in the garden and at the dinner table. This wrestling promo vibe also gives us the second best joke in the whole series. Hey, I got my eye on you. Water tribe. As for the fight proper, the first half of the episode is a beautiful send-up of pro wrestling pageantry that serves to demonstrate the physical prowess and unique fighting styles of all the goons Toph will have to take on in the climax, especially the boulder, while also establishing that they're using those talents mostly to put on a show. Fire Nation Man does great heel work, and he's a great sport about people throwing rocks at him. Still, they are all impressively athletic, which only makes it more impressive when, after the boulder's done fighting them, Toph makes him crumple like cheap tissue paper without even breaking a sweat. The boulder takes issue with that comment. The first demonstration we get of her ability to see with her feet is absolutely gorgeous, and a liberal application of slow motion Sakuga highlights just how adept she is at moving and fighting. Aang, a master martial artist to himself, actually puts those skills to the test when he comes up to talk to her, and the close-up shots of both fighters' attacks and footwork really sell their individual skill. Aang ultimately wins the knockout in that fight, but only by cheating with airbending, which comes back to bite the both of them later. And if there was any doubt that Toph is the superior fighter, she crushes it along with the seven guys she fights at once in the episode's climax. Like when they bust Aang out of his cage and he hops out ready to go, Sokka's just like, nah dog, take a break, she got this. From a strategic standpoint, Toph's approach to this Hell in a Cell rematch is brilliant. And it's also a brilliant showcase of her talents as a fighter. By filling the ring with dust, she turns the tables on her sighted opponents and can pick them off one by one. Not that she really needs to be stealthy. Each one does get a chance to attack her, but only so that we can get a chance to see her systematically dismantle their unique styles of earthbending. She is a true master, and none of the tricks they pull, not even popping out of the ground or hopping around like a frog, can get past her defenses. Every single move Toph makes in this fight looks awesome and highlights both her physical skill and her quick tactical mind. But her final showdown with the fight promoter is on the next level. Snappy, smooth, seemingly rotoscoped animation, dramatic, dynamic camera angles, and flashy effects make this earthbending exchange look incredible. You can tell this guy is really skilled, but Toph listens and she waits, and for all his flashy flailing about, she's still able to knock him down with just one decisive blow. It is just plain badass. She is just plain badass. And in this one badass episode, Avatar is able to dedicate basically 100% of its animation budget to showing us exactly how badass Toph is. This whole fight is straight up animated martial arts porn. And while it may not be the best example of all of the things that make Avatar amazing, the Blind Bandit will always, without question, be the first episode I pull out when I'm in the mood to watch animated teenagers hurt people. I, I think there might be something wrong with me.